Hi, um, I'm a graduate student in political science. Um, I'm just starting my dissertation project, and today I'm going to present the theory behind that project. I started data gathering this summer. I have no data to show you, so this is five minutes of a theory. Um, hopefully, you guys can help me with the framework. Um, my focus in this dissertation is on threat perception. I'm interested in conflict and I'm interested in cognition, so the intersection of those two things. Threat perception is a, a useful and interesting field for me. It's also some place that I think the traditional models in political science leave a bit to be desired. Um, those traditional models, we actually saw this yesterday, uh, Hobbes's Leviathan. They assume that threat in this is often violent harm. So we've been talking a lot about this. Threat as um, the threat of violence as being the sort of primary driver. And what does it drive? It drives seeking security. And a lot of times in international relations theory and theories of conflict, we implicitly define threat as violent harm and implicitly define the threat mitigation strategy as seeking protection from violent harm. But I think that this concept misses a little bit of what we've been talking about here, which are threats that are immaterial, threats that are based on someone's religion or identity without their resorting to violence. And it also misses potentially some strategies for mitigating threats. So it may not be that every way to feel safe is about feeling safe from violent harm. So instead, I've devo sort of developed this model based on findings from biological sciences, from the cognitive sciences, taking explicitly an evolutionary perspective. Because threat perception is something that I think is fairly characterized as an adaptive behavior. And when you start to look at threat perception as an adaptive behavior, um, as a political scientist, I can then go to a whole other literature outside my field where people have extensively researched this. And it turns out that there are a few ways that, that we've kind of discovered that people think about threats. In fact, there are threats beyond violent harm. As individuals, we are worried about our bodies, and we are worried about the threat of death, obviously. But we're also worried about disease. We're worried about things that are not death, short of death, have other consequences. As individuals, we also have stuff. And one of the threats we face is losing our stuff. But as individuals, as we've pointed out a number of times in the last day and a half, we are also members of groups. And there are certain threats that we can perceive by virtue of being members of groups. One is that we can lose our status, either within a group or our group itself can lose its status, and we can lose our freedoms. Another thing that we can lose, and this has sort of just been recently brought up, is that the integrity of the group, what defines it, its moral and social purity, that's also pretty vulnerable. And we can perceive all of these different threats. There's, there are a lot of citations down here. I'm happy to share any of them uh, if anyone's interested. There's basically a neurobiological component to this that I'm not going to go into because we're more interested in today, I think, in outcomes and behaviors. And this is about threat perception as a cause of war. But basically, there's a sort of neurobiological sense in which these threats are perceived and detected by different systems, very much as Anthony talked about. And that these are, I'm sort of highlighting three systems here, three types of threats, death, loss, and contamination. And there's an affective response that goes with this, death, um, actually fear, loss, anger, contamination, disgust. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later, um, but not in this five minutes. What I'm interested now in is the behavioral responses. So these neurobiological systems generate behavioral preferences. When we're faced with these threats, we have ways in which we prefer to respond. They're mitigation strategies. These are sort of efficient ways to deal with a threat within a particular heuristic. So death, and again, as Anthony mentioned, mostly you flee. If you can flee, you would. Um, but sometimes you can't, and then you fight. And as he mentioned, as you aggregate up, so Individuals acting alone can flee, usually. Individuals acting on behalf of groups, deciding what a group should do in aggregate, the larger that group gets, the, the harder it is to use that flight strategy. With loss, the tendency is to protect what you have. But if something has been taken from you, the tendency is to take it back. And so what you want to do is redress that loss. With contamination, you isolate the healthy population. But with a contaminant, and there's some really cool thought experiments you can perform to test this, but basically the thing that eases the sense that a contaminant is truly gone is eradication. And you would eradicate something if you have a sufficient power imbalance. So if you think about how humans deal with actual vermin, cockroaches, infestations, you can squash them, 
right? I mean, this is sort of what we, we like to do. But when this is a social contaminant, when this is another group of people, obviously this causes problems. So how does threat perception become a cause of war? Well, in each one of these three cases, if you're operating in these heuristics, preemptive, aggressive action can make sense. So in this case, if you cannot flee, and you think that some sort of attack is inevitable, fighting and moving first makes sense. If you perceive something to have been taken from you, whether in the recent past or the historical past, trying to take it back makes sense. If you think that some group among you is a social contaminant and they are threatening your way of life, your moral integrity, genocide and ethnic cleansing make sense. They're logically consistent within that heuristic. So this is a way in which you could say that threat perception, depending on particular contexts, can sort of incite aggressive action. So it's not all about defense. Um, I'm going to end there. I will say that in my research, I'm applying this framework in three different ways. Um, this kind of gets the data question, which I won't go into. One is to look at American foreign policy and individual policy makers. Another is to actually get to the micro foundations of this, that neurobiological component that I mentioned with respect to um, looking at attitudes towards domestic policy and immigration. And finally, looking at intergroup violence directed particularly at groups that are called social contaminants. <laughs>